I think okay. we're live. I think we're live, but I do want to know what you were doing in Montana, Victor. <laughs> um, great. Okay. Well, welcome everyone to our path forward. Um, our path forward is a weekly Facebook live show by Care Washington, and it's a, a space that gives viewers a behind the scenes look at the work that we do at Care Washington, and it invites. Uh, viewers to join with us in reimagining what our path forward looks like in this post-Trump, uh, inshallah, post-COVID era. So today we are talking about dismantling systemic Islamophobia, and we're joined by CARE Washington Director, Executive Director uh, Imran Siddiqui, and with our honored guest today, community activist, civil rights attorney, Arjun Singh Sethi. Arjun is a civil rights lawyer, writer, teacher, and consultant based in Washington, DC. He is adjunct professor of law at Georgetown University Law Center and Vanderbilt University Law School, where he teaches courses on policing, surveillance, and counterterrorism. We are really excited to have you here today, Arjun. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, cool. Well, let's jump right into it. Um, Arjun, can you tell us a bit more about yourself and the work that you've done researching and educating people on Islamophobia? So again, thank you for the very kind introduction. I'm a community activist. I'm a human rights lawyer and law professor. Um, and a lot of my work has been working with local community organizations across the country, um, amplifying the important work they do um, it was in that capacity that I connected with Imran and the amazing work he used to do in Arizona that he's now doing um, in Seattle to take on Islamophobia, um, to take on anti-Muslim policies domestically and internationally. Um, and more recently, a lot of my work has been um, to support survivors of hate and hate violence across America, including Muslims who've been targeted on account of who they are and what they do. Awesome, thank you so much for that. And I wanna get a little bit later more into uh, the book that you wrote. Um, and I'm forgetting the name right now. <laughs> I have it here somewhere, but, but um, I want to talk a little bit about just the, what, what Islamophobia is. I think, you know, most people understand it to be fear of Muslims or people who are perceived to be Muslim. But I'm wondering if you can talk more about like, how you understand Islamophobia and give us some more like tangible like, examples of what Islamophobia looks like. Sure. Um, <clears throat> I mean, uh, there are people who've written books on Islamophobia. There are people who theorize about Islamophobia. Um, I can speak about it from what I've seen from a community impact perspective and what I've seen from a sort of international context. Um, so I think I would start by saying Islamophobia or anti-Muslim hate sentiment, whatever it is you want to call it, is a global phenomenon. Um, we are seeing this in the United States. Mm -hmm. We are seeing this across Asia. Um, we are seeing small towns in Europe passing anti-Muslim, anti-Sharia ordinances, even though those towns don't even have Muslim communities, right? And so Islamophobia, anti-Muslim sentiment is a global phenomenon. And I think in general, it manifests in two ways, um, in an interpersonal context. And so that is the bullying of Muslims in schools, for example. It is hate, uh, acts of hate against Muslims. It's the desecration and vandalism of mosques. So this is actually individuals bullying, hurting, um, attacking Muslims and their houses of worship, again, precisely because they are Muslims. And then Islamophobia also manifests, of course, on a um, state level as well. And so in that sense, you can think about the Muslim ban. Donald Trump said he was going to ban Muslims, and then he passed and signed the Muslim ban. Um, it can also be the uh, sort of anti-Sharia laws um, uh, that you see being passed across you know, cities and towns in America. It could be even uh, these governors years ago saying, we aren't going to welcome refugees into our states. Um, and in so many ways, those uh, policies were rooted in Islamophobia because they didn't wanna welcome uh, uh, refugee Muslims into their communities. Um, 
again, in an international context, look at Guantanamo Bay. I've served as a legal observer at Guantanamo Bay, and Guantanamo Bay is and always has been a prison for Muslim men. The last point I wouldn't want to make, and I think there's some important work happening in this sense, um, is that Islamophobia also manifests in just sort of popular culture. And so for a long time, when you turned on the television, anytime you would see a brown person, they would typically be a taxi driver, a shopkeeper, which are honorable professions, to be clear, um, or a terrorist, which of course is terrible. Um, but the point being that in popular media and mass culture, um, there were no depictions of the diversity within the Muslim community, no depictions of, again, the diversity within the broader sort of like pan brown community. And so those are just some different ways in which kind of Islamophobia manifests um, um, and sort of how I've seen it and how I perceive it. Thank you for that explanation. And like you talked about, it's it affects not just Muslims, it affects anyone that people perceive to be Muslim. So it could be someone who's Arab, but they're Christian or someone who's from the Sikh community. Um, I wanted to ask a question of both of you actually. You know, there's been a lot of solidarity between American Muslims and American Sikhs and in response to Islamophobia. Um, the Sikh community has often been the target of Islamophobia. Um, and probably the most well-known example was the Sikh temple shooting in 2012, where six killed and four others were injured. And most recently, we had the shooting at the Indianapolis FedEx facility, where a gunman killed eight people, four of them were members of the Sikh community. And we know that that FedEx was over 90% staffed by members of the Sikh community. I've always been impressed with, and honestly a bit surprised by, um, the Sikh community's boldness in standing with the Muslim community against Islamophobia. Because to me, it seems like, you know, I'm thinking like if I was from the Sikh community, I would wanna distance myself from Muslims and from the Muslim community to try to protect myself from the racism and violence that is directed at Muslims. So I just wanna ask this question to both of you, like, can you talk about this relationship and, and why you think it exists? You wanna start, Imran? Yeah, I mean, just anecdotally, it's, it's you know, the first person that was killed in post 9-11 era was um, a sick individual uh, in actually Mesa, Arizona. Um, and yeah, Balbir Singh Sodi, and that was really something that was, you know, shocking um, because there was just like this massive torrent of hate that was out there. And then somebody just out of ignorance goes out there and, and kills a, a sick individual. And so we've seen this replaying over and over again over the course of the past 20 plus years. And it's just a function of, of hate and white supremacy where, um, you know, we've seen many Sikh temples targeted gurdwaras, um, whether it's in California, whether it's across the country, uh, tons of vandalisms. You've seen uh, increases in road rage, rage, but also like the structural Islamophobia, um, the national security state also has like followed uh, practitioners of the Sikh faith as well in terms of getting extra screening at airports, having to be patted down, removing their turbans and things like that. So a lot of our struggles are shared struggles. And um, I think we've, we've come together as communities over the course of the past 20 years, you know, through efforts of, of people like Arjun and, and so many others who are, um, you know, getting together and just talking about like, we, none of us are free until we're all free. And so just understanding the different struggles that everybody's going through on a day-to-day -day basis, sitting down at these different tables, and how do we um, you know, fight for e each other's collective liberation. And it's, it's a struggle. Um, it's ongoing up, like you mentioned, up until uh, this very day with these mass shootings. And even though it doesn't grab the headlines the same way that it did maybe in, you know, 2002 or 2010 or after an Oak Creek or after a Christchurch or, a, a, you know, Quebec City shooting, these things are still happening, but they're just not getting that attention. They're, when you're a part of that community that is, is being targeted, like six in Indianapolis or the Asian American community and that uh, Georgia shooting, it hits home and you feel it very viscerally that this is hate that is driving this type of attack. And so it's just something that our communities, unfortunately, have to 
live through together, but it's also giving us opportunities to build together. Yeah, thank you so much, Imran. Um, you know, in many cases, uh, six are targeted simply because they're six. We are perceived to be the other. And so we are attacked because maybe we have brown skin, um, because we have beards, because we have turbans, whatever it happens to be. And, and there's a history of anti-sick violence in America that dates back to the 19th century when six first immigrated. Having said that, there are times where Sikhs are targeted uh, because they are mistaken to be Muslim, because they are perceived to be Muslim. And I think the most important takeaway from that is, for the most part, Sikhs have responded through solidarity, right? They have not responded by saying, we're not Muslims, leave us alone. Um, they've responded by saying, we are in solidarity with Muslims. Um, we share many values. Um, uh, nobody is free until we are all free. And so as you know, Imran said, a lot of the struggles that the Muslim community has, the Sikh community has as well. Um, and so I think that there has been um, extraordinary solidarity um, really since sort of the post 9-11 era. It existed before then too, um, but I think we've also seen it much more clearly and much more sort of visibly uh, post 9-11 and it, um, you know, continues today. And I think it's, uh, it's exemplary and I'm, and I'm really proud um, of all of the six yeah. who, who work in close collaboration with, you know, Muslim activists um, and organizers across the country. Thank you both for that. I, that's important to note, Arjun, and I appreciate you saying that is like, I was thinking more about, you know, oh, a lot of times the Sikh community gets mistaken for being Muslims, but I mean, America is a white supremacist country, of course, since the first Sikh person came over to America, they're not Christian, they're not white, um, there's discrimination. So it exists, you know, just from being the other, as you say. So I think that's important to note. Um, I want to talk with you about your book and I now I have the title, <laughs> American Hate Survivors Speak Out. I think you wrote this in 2016. Uh, I was reading an article in the New Press and they described it as a quote, moving and timely collection of testimonials from people impacted by hate before and after the 2016 presidential election. Can you tell us a bit more about this book, uh, how you went across the country and researched these, these hate crimes and how did you come up with the idea to write this book? Um. So I'll start by saying that the book would not have been possible without the support of community organizations um, like, you know, uh, at, the, at that point it was CARE Arizona, um, community activists like Imran. And, um, you know, I think in the, in the acknowledgments of the book, I actually say this book required a community. So many people picked me up at airports, um, drove me on unfamiliar roads and welcomed me into their homes. And so again, I just, you know, want to, you know, thank Imran and, and, and really celebrate the work that, you know, CARE Washington is doing. Um, so the book was published in 2018. And the reason I published it and the reason I, 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 I traveled the country in 2017 chronicling these different stories was because in my work with community organizations, in my work with survivors of hate violence, um, I had the impression that they felt like they were being left behind. Um, America was becoming desensitized to hate violence. We were normalizing it. And really the media would report on it and then move on. The public would engage and then lose interest. And yet survivors still struggle. Um, survivors still have ongoing needs, both in the short term, medium term and long term. And so I thought, what if I wrote a book that was a compilation of testimonials of people targeted by hate. And I use the word testimonial because that's what each chapter is, right? I, I, I thought that if I met survivors on their own terms, in their homes, houses of worship, you know, workplaces, community centers, they would tell me their stories. Because if you email someone and say, hey, write me a 3000 word story about how you were, you know, the victim of a hate crime or how your mosque was desecrated, they don't know you, they don't know who you are. And a lot of people are struggling. They themselves are coming to terms with it. And so, yeah, I went across the country. I went to Whitefish, Montana. I went to um, Tulsa, Oklahoma. I went to Victoria, Texas. Um, you know, for those who say that rhetoric um, doesn't matter, 
um, you know, the day that Donald Trump announced that he was intending to ban Muslims from the United States, this was now in 2015, a mosque was found outside the uh, El Aqsa Islamic uh, Mosque in, the, in um, uh, Philadelphia. Um, and I went to that mosque. And Marwan Crady in my book tells the story of the Philadelphia Muslim community and what it was like to find a pig's head outside the mosque that day. Fast forward. The day that Donald Trump signs the Muslim ban into law, this is now, you know, early January 2017, actually late January 2017, a mosque in Victoria, Texas is burned to the ground. Um, I went and visited that community in Victoria, the Victoria Islamic, uh, you know, Islamic mosque, and they told me their story, Shahid Hashmi. Um, so rhetoric matters, policy matters. Um, and so, yeah, the book includes testimonials of people from the Muslim community. Uh, there's an Arab Christian perspective, the Jabaras from Tulsa, Oklahoma, um, Latinx, undocumented, queer, um, trans, um, really because we were living in a moment, and we still are, where many, many marginalized folks are being continuously targeted on account of who they are and what they believe. Um, and so I was proud of that project. And you know, when the book came out in 2018, I was able to do lots of community events. I did a wonderful event at the local bookstore um, in Arizona with the support of CARE that actually ended up being the biggest event I had at any bookstore in my entire tour. I think we were in Tempe. Is that right, Imran? Yeah, Tempe, Changing Hands Bookstore, shout out. Changing Hands Bookstore. I mean, we sold every copy that day and it was just, it was amazing. And we had such a wonderful turnout. Um, and so that's just another example of of the important work that you know community orgs do. Because again, right, even after I leave these communities, right, who is looking out for survivors? It's it's the local community activists, it's the local community organizations. Thank you, Arjun. We'll put a um a link to your book in the comments so people can get a copy. We also have a lot at the office, I think, too. So nice. maybe when we open back up, maybe we could give those out if people stop by. But we're not open yet. Um, cool. So I wanted to shift to talking a bit about the 20 year anniversary of 9-11 that's coming up. Um, I think 9-11, you know, is one of those things that really defined our generation. And this is, of course, especially true for Muslim Americans and those that are often perceived to be Muslim, uh, like Sikh Americans. For the 15 year anniversary, I found an article that you wrote in The Guardian. It was titled, 9-11 was 15 years ago. Why do so many of us feel less safe? I wanted to read an excerpt from that article. You said, I always thought that things would get better. I was born and raised in Virginia, played soccer as a kid, and went to high school football games with my friends. Apart from my sick articles of faith, a turban and a beard, I didn't feel too different from my peers. America was my home. But 15 years later, I feel worse than I did then. Profiling, hate violence, and bigotry now braid through the daily lives of Muslim, Arab, Sikh, and South Asian Americans. We are outsiders looking in, forever struggling for equality and understanding. Really powerful piece. I will also link that in the comments if folks want to read that. I wanted to ask you, now that we're, as we're approaching the 20-year anniversary now of 9-11, how do you feel about your place in America? And do you think that we've made any progress when it comes to Islamophobia, both cultural and, and systemic? You know, I remember writing that piece and it's been so long, or at least, I mean, it was five years ago, but it might as well have been a lifetime ago. Um, I think that was before Trump was elected. It was before COVID. I mean, you know, I wanna start by saying as I had mentioned before, Islamophobia, discrimination against um, um, sex, anti-Black racism, um, you know, these are things, right? These are forces, white supremacy, um, that this country has struggled with since its inception. And um, while I, I think, you know, was pretty privileged to feel pretty included um, and safe and comfortable um, you know, as a high schooler growing up in Virginia. When I was younger in elementary school, I was bullied a lot, but in high school, it, 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 it felt comfortable and it felt generally safe. 
But for me personally, 9-11 was a demarcation point. And, you know, I was recently asked to actually, um, as part of an exercise, to write a timeline of my life, right, to draw a line. And I am not married. And so otherwise, that probably would have been maybe the first line I wrote or, 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 or tick. But I, I wrote this, I, I drew this line. And I'm supposed to mark the most important days of my life. And 9-11 was the first day that I marked. I marked it as the most important day of my life. Um, and I think it's because um, for so many different communities, um, our lives changed. Our lives changed in how we were perceived and how we were seen and how we were treated, um, how the state related to us. Again, not that this wasn't in existence before, it was, but sometimes these things ebb and flow Sometimes you just need a catalyst for these ugly dark forces to rear their head again. And I think in so many ways, that's what we saw with Donald Trump. Um, and so I think 9-11 was a demarcation point, um, as you know, uh, Imran mentioned, um, the first fatality, sort of hate motivated fatality after 9-11 was the murder of Bobir Singh Sodhi. Um, there were countless other incidents after, um, you know, the story I sometimes tell is my, you know, dad a few days later was at a McDonald's and someone wouldn't serve him a cheeseburger. I was at Georgetown University, somebody jumped in front of my car, I think it was September 14, 2001, and yelled, go home. Um, and so it was difficult in terms of where we are now. Yeah, I mean, I think, I, I, I think we've made some progress, um, but we haven't made enough, right? I mean, that's the point, right? Given that it's been 20 years, right? Like, I, I, I think we have made some progress, um, but yeah, I mean, Guantanamo Bay is still open. Um, we have never really accounted for all the different policies and ways in which the state targeted Muslims immediately afterwards, including NCRs, for example. Um, we were just coming off the Muslim ban, for example. And so one of the things that I've been pushing for and other people have been pushing for um, is a commission, right? I mean, we can have a commission to talk about why people stormed the Capitol. Let's have a commission to talk about the extraordinarily overreaching ways in which the US government responded domestically to Muslims and the way they responded internationally to Muslims, including you know, Guantanamo Bay, torture in Iraq, the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, even today, right? Like it shouldn't come as a surprise that extrajudicial drone strike disproportionately target Muslim majority countries. And so I, I, I think we've made some progress, um, but it's not enough. Um, and I think there needs to be a reckoning. And, and one of the asks that, again, a lot of us have made yeah. is for this commission. Is that the same commission that we're advocating for, Imran, do you know? Um, probably not, but I mean, it's, it's good to keep this in the lexicon. I think Arjun mm -hmm. makes a lot of good points in terms of not letting this time frame go. I mean, we're, what, six months into this new administration, but there's so many you know, crimes that this previous administration did with impunity. And if we do not like come to reckoning with those crimes of the past, like we're doomed to repeat those things uh, again. So it's really okay. important to have these types of conversations. But just to piggyback off of- And now we have a, yeah. Off of um, what Arjun said, I mean, you know, and I think we learned a lot of lessons in these past 20 years, but now we're just seeing a lot of this, uh, you know, global war on terrorism rhetoric sort of expand outward into the international sphere. So now global Islamophobia is like this major issue that we have to contend with, um, you know, when you're, when you're dealing with how um, the Uyghur people are being treated in East Turkestan, for example, how the language of dehumanization takes place for Palestinians at the hands of uh, the Israeli defense forces, um, the Rohingya uh, genocide that's been taken, taken on in Myanmar. Um, Arjun's been a massive voice for minority rights in India, and he's been super targeted for his, for his voice. I mean, global Islamophobia, uh, there's no better understanding of what's happening in such a cramped, like 1.2 billion population than what's happening in India right now, because this is a manifestation across like all facets of government in the entire country. So, you know, props to Arjun also for raising this issue on a, on a global level as well. 
Yeah, one thing I will add, and just to sort of you know back up Imran here, he's totally right. In an international context, it has absolutely gotten worse. Mm -hmm. Like when we're looking at Europe, when you're looking at India, um, when you're looking at yeah. China and broader Asia, it has absolutely gotten worse. Um, so my comments are mostly about, I think, sort of the U.S. context, where I think you could argue that there has been incremental improvement, yeah. um, but in the global context, it has deteriorated. That's an important distinction, because I was thinking, when I wrote this question, I was thinking the U.S. as well, um, but that's an important distinction to talk about globally, you know, what's happened with Islamophobia being exported. Um, Let's see, I lost my place here. Give me one sec, guys. Imran, this is a question for you. I know you've talked a bit about your experience growing up as a brown Muslim kid in America and how also like how Arjun talked about how 9-11 really changed your life and your professional priorities. I was wondering if you could talk a bit about your experience growing up as a Muslim kid in Georgia and what that was like and how your life changed after 9-11. Yeah, I mean, for me, I think it was it was pretty similar to Arjun. Um, you know, I've always been proud of, of my heritage and, and uh, my religion and where I came from. Um, I was probably growing up, you know, going to elementary, middle school and high school in Georgia. I was probably the only uh, Muslim in my school or maybe one of two Muslims in my entire school so I was for a lot of people that that one representation of like what a Muslim is and by and large like this is the pre 9-11 era so I was you know treated respectfully I was you know talking about you know my culture and uh, classes during social studies and, and things like that um, and then like in as I got to college and then the post 9-11 era hit then that's a complete change. So now kids that are going to school, um, their experience is going to be much different than ours was growing up. You know, they're dealing with just this massive propaganda machine. We've seen it from a care Washington perspective and how Islam and even the event of 9-11 is introduced in class. I had to deal with it in Arizona as well, where they um, in 2019 even, or yeah, 2019, they're still showing videos produced by like Steve Emerson or having Stephen Emerson as like a protagonist, you know, and these are things that were made in like 2002, 2003. For those who don't know, Stephen Emerson is one of the yeah. foremost hate group leaders in the United States, one of the leading anti-Muslim figures. And so it's a constant struggle. And we see now like in this aftermath of young students who are growing up today in, in, in this environment, you know, there's a greater potential propensity for Muslim students to be bullied um, you know, targeted for their faith, they're twice as likely to be bullied um, than, their, uh, than their peers. This is according to a, a study by CARE California. So it's tough. Um, I mean, I, I, when I was in college, so I was dealing with this sort of backlash during that time. And it was, it was just an interesting thing just to see this propaganda. But it also very much shaped, like Arjun said, it shaped who I was as a person. And I was sort of headed on one trajectory probably professionally in life and I was pursuing something else, but just this constant torrent of misinformation, it drew me into action. So I started writing and like challenging these, these stereotypes and things like that on a independent basis. And then just built up my name over time and then started volunteering with the care chapter in Arizona around 2011. Um, and you know, 10 years later, I'm still doing this stuff professionally. So um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's been something that's shaped our lives, but we've also seen, you know, the escalation that's taken place in the blatant level of, of this hate um, that's, that's taken place. I lived in Phoenix in 2015, so we saw the first armed mosque protest that took place um, outside the Islamic Community Center of Phoenix, where people were standing with AR-15 assault rifles and masks. Before masks were, you know, necessary, people were wearing, like, you know, masks and balaclavas and all that type of stuff, uh, dressed up in military fatigues, um, you know, threatening uh, the Muslim community over there. And rather than law enforcement considering this like a hate incident, this was considered to be a free speech uh, rally or a Second Amendment rally. And so there's no wonder that a few years down the road, you have somebody walk into uh, 
you know, the Quebec City Mosque and start opening fire or uh, the Christchurch Mosque in New Zealand and start opening fire and countless others. I mean, these are the worst fears of a faith community to be targeted in this way, but all those seeds were planted and there was really sort of a negligence while the government was focusing on countering Muslim extremism at home and, uh, you know, these types of yeah. overarching programs, we see just this rise of violent white supremacy coming up through the, through the ranks and really gone unchecked until you had what, you know, turns out to be like almost a mass shooting per week. Yeah. Thank you for that, Imran. Um, I want to switch to talking about systemic Islamophobia specifically and where we are today in regards to systemic Islamophobia. Uh, after 9-11, we had the Bush administration, the war on terror, which really, as uh, Imran talked about, exported Islamophobia while making it mainstream here in the US. We had the cre creation of Department of Home Homeland Security and the Countering Violent Extremism, CVE program that led to the US government spying on thousands of Muslim Americans and placing them on watch list. After that, I'm just going through each administration <laughs> highlights. Then we had Obama who not only embraced the US drone program as part of the continuing covert war on terror, but he actually carried out 10 times 10 times more airstrikes than his predecessor, George W. Bush. And then after Obama, and perhaps in reaction to his presidency as the first black president, uh, white conservatives elected Trump in part because of his promise to implement a quote, total and complete ban on Muslims entering the US. Trump later you know, tried his best to make good on that promise by passing uh, the Muslim ban and the African ban via executive order. So my question is this, where are we at with the Biden administration in regards to systemic Islamophobia? So via the federal government, I guess. Um, and how does this compare to previous administrations? But also we could talk just broader, more broadly about systemic Islamophobia as it currently stands in the US. Um, and that's a question for both of you guys. Go ahead, Arjun, if you wanna take it. First. I mean, you know, the question um, was very detailed and in being detailed, um, I think almost provided a kind of answer, right? Like when we think about CVE, when we think about extrajudicial drone strikes, when we think about watch lists, um, the NYPD mapping program, mapping programs um, that are still actually allowed under the DOJ racial profiling guidance, um, suspicious activity reporting. Mm -hmm. A lot of what you described, a lot of what we're talking about in this conversation is still going on. Having said that, there is more awareness, there is more litigation, um, there is more organizing um, in opposition um, to a lot of these programs. Um, and so again, I think that on the domestic side, we have seen some incremental improvements but it's not enough, right? I mean, just earlier today, I think there was a note that I saw, I didn't get a chance to read it about CVE in schools. And so one of the issues that we have is, and, and this is why it's so difficult, and this is part of the problem with it being structural and institutional is sometimes you will see a program end, but it will then be reimagined and accomplish the same purpose, right? And so that's one of the reasons that we have to be especially thoughtful, right? Because if people are afraid of Muslims, right? If we are going to dis, if, 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 if law enforcement continues to believe that they pose a disproportionate threat to our safety, which of course they don't, right? We know that you are more likely to be harmed or hurt by a white supremacist than any other community uh, in the United States today. And yet we remain myopically focused on Muslims. And so having said that, um, I think there has been incremental progress. Um, but we need to just be especially mindful of existing programs. And when we do make progress, watching for different ways in which these programs are reimagined, repurposed, and just ended up and end up sort of targeting us in the same exact ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those are all good points. Um, I think that's one thing that we learned uh, that we smartened up about during the Obama administration is that like outwardly, a lot of times, like, you know, one side of the political spectrum will present itself as being very inclusive and and welcoming towards your community even having 
you know, a little bit of inclusion in terms of representation when it comes to positions that are visible within the administration. So that's just one aspect of it. But then like in what they're actually doing at home and abroad, like during the Obama era, you saw the proliferation of countering, countering violent extremism programs, which essentially criminalize Muslims and, you know, taught folks to basically spy on their own communities. And that became like a very big issue um, domestically for our communities and a very big chasm in our communities. During that time, you saw the proliferation of drones during the Obama administration, more drone usage than any present president uh, before him. So yes, Trump was overtly out there and, you know, banning Muslims from coming into the country and very overt about his disdain for Islam and Muslims. However, you can't rest on your laurels when it comes to that type of stuff. And it's a, it's a, you have to continuously chip away. So what happened with the Muslim ban, even though you signed an executive order with repealing the Muslim ban, that's good on the surface, but then there's so many people who are impacted by the Muslim ban during the previous four or five years that, you know, they were just left in limbo where they, they ha had issue, visas issued for example, and they just basically got canceled out. So what type of recourse do those folks have? We actually had our Muslim days at the Capitol this week, and we were talking to our elected officials about like what type of recourse do people who were targeted by the Muslim ban have? Um, you know, Why do they have to move to the back of the line now if they wanna to come to the United States? So there's deeply entrenched problems that still exist within the system. And then in terms of how things play out on a international level, like with, you know, we keep going back to the Palestine issue, like you just saw 67 Palestinians, Palestinian children slaughtered in the just in the past few weeks. These are human beings. The, if you saw 67 kids dying that happened to be any other race or religion, it would be a worldwide outrage. But our elected officials and our system over here is basically, you know, has this Pavlovi, Pavlovian response to these types of atrocities saying that Israel has a right to defend itself and basically just does away with it, issuing like $5 million of aid to Gaza, which is, won't even build like a you know refrigerator you know, in, in that type of area. So these types of things, you know, when it comes to uh, you know, Saudi's atrocities and in Yemen and, and other places, like Islamophobia doesn't necessarily rear its, itself the same ways that it would in previous iterations. So we just have to really look and see like how, um, how to fight it at every level, no matter where, uh, what the issue is. Do you guys still think it's Trump's America? Like I know Arjun, when you talked a lot about Trump's America, you know, that time and he's gone, but it doesn't feel like he's really gone. Do you guys still feel like it's Trump's America? I mean, Trump was a sy symptom, right? I mean, hate, pre-existed Donald Trump, hate will endure long after Donald Trump. Um, but Donald Trump spoke to a large group of Americans. Um, he's, even after the election, right? I mean, he still got a lot of votes. It was still a, a, a generally close election. Um, and so there are these terrible dark forces of white supremacy, anti-black racism, Islamophobia and the like that have been around for a very long time. And so part of the reason we are in this moment is because we haven't done that reckoning, right? And, and the reason, for example, I call my book American Hate um, is that in so many ways, it's a play on American exceptionalism, right? Americans love to believe and love to say that we don't have this history, right? That we don't need to do this work and love to go around lecturing the world about human rights and civil rights. Um, and yet, in fact, one of America's um, most terrible and prolific exports is actually hate. And, you know, one of the examples I give is that, you know, in, in the 1930s, the Nazis actually became obsessed with American jurisprudence because right. they, they couldn't quite, they didn't, they were fascinated by the idea that the Americans had actually created a legal system called separate but equal that allowed them to openly and lawfully discriminate against African Americans. And they wondered how could we recreate that same system of laws in Nazi Germany, right? Nobody ever talks about that history, yeah. right? And so, I mean, I, I mean, there's still a lot of America that is still Trump's America. And there are a lot of America that will continue to be Trump's America unless we do the work. Yep. 
yeah, I mean, agree with what Arjun said. It's, uh, you know, even though the the administration has has changed, it's still, you know, you see what the outrage machine is is doing right now. Like we move on from uh, outrage about uh, Sharia law, and now it's about like critical race theory, and people are willing to like you know, fight tooth and nail on this issue, even though they don't know, you know, what, it, what it's about. So it just moves, it keeps taking different shape over the course of, of time. So yeah, I mean, we have a, a long way to go. And um, just because somebody wins the election or somebody takes control of one of the houses of Congress or both houses of Congress doesn't mean that you've dismantled white supremacy for good. It's still right. very much here. And it's something we have to reckon with. I was reading up on some of the like the reaction by white racist in the 60s against segregation or excuse me against integration they were segregationists and the parallels between what they were saying then and what they're saying now about critical race theory is shockingly like <laughs> the same they're talking they're saying you know integration is a communist plot they're saying they were saying integration is divisive and it's racist, like the exact same talking points that we're now just regurgitating against CRT. I thought it was really uh, like illuminating. Um, Arjun, I know you have to go soon. I wanna ask one last question that's maybe a bit more empower empowering. Um, it's a big one though, a big question. So my question for both of you is, what does dismantling systemic and cultural Islamophobia look like? And how do we undo, or at least challenge, the legacy of 9-11 and the subsequent war on terror? So it's kind of a big question to end with, but. Imran, why don't you start? Yeah, I mean, I don't have all the great answers. I think the way that we've seen our communities come together, like so somebody like me who's out there in Arizona prior to here, you know, coming together with somebody like Arjun from DC, and being at these, you know, gatherings together, working together to come up with solutions, whether it's ways to challenge the Muslim ban while it was in play, you know, pushing for the no ban act and, and doing whatever we can, no matter what level of hate is emanating from the highest levels of our government, um, we as marginalized communities can come together and build together uh, to try and build a better future together. And so uh, folks like like this, like, you know, all of our allies out here that we've gotten together with and have really started to learn, like, what are some things that we need to do internally as communities as well, like brown people and anti-blackness, those are some great conversations that we do. So we can't, we can't miss on those conversations as well. So that's just continuing to build together, get together around the same tables and, and work across religious, racial, uh, socioeconomic lines to try and dismantle these systems is, is I think, the first step. Yeah, I don't have too much to add. I think education is important. Education, solidarity. I mean, those are just three really important values, right? Um, but again, the burden can't just be on us, right? It, it, it can't be on us. And um, we need help. We need lots of help. Um, you know, and, and, and I mean, Imran talked about how, um, you know, there are times in Arizona where folks have tried to go to mosque and had to pass by gun-toting white supremacists. And so we need white allies to step up. We need white allies to do the work too. Um, and so absolutely building solidarity in and among communities of color, learning from elders in the movement, um, centering black and native voices, um, you know, continuing to do the important education work um, and then just sort of everyone figuring out their role within sort of a broader ecosystem mm -hmm. of change and, and making a difference. Yeah, awesome. Well, thank you both so much. I really, Arjun, appreciate you taking the time to be here with us today to have this conversation. It's been a great conversation. Um, I did want to plug our episode next week. So next week we're going to be joined by South Seattle Emerald founder and journalist, Marcus Green. And we're gonna be talking about community journalism and the shifting media landscape. So very excited for that episode. Thank you both so much. Um, I'm sure we could talk about this more, but we are out of time, so. All right, take care. Thank you. Thanks guys.